welcome everybody again. Thanks for joining us uh, for another WorldViz webinar. Um, today we've got three presenters. Uh, myself, Dan Tinkham. I'm the head of sales for Americas here at WorldViz. Uh, we'll also be joined by Felix Rudert and Sato Rabaudi. Uh, Felix is our VizMove product manager, which is our hardware line, and then Sato is our Vizard software product manager. So he's uh, really more on the on the software side of things. But Sato's uh, also one of our key business development reps, so he works a lot with our hardware partners, the folks who are really developing these uh, other pieces that we'll be talking about today. So uh, that's just who you'll, you'll be hearing today on the webinar. Um, I'll be more or less the moderator. Here's the topics we're going to be going through uh, during this, this webinar on the role of uh, hardware in VR research and development. Uh, the first topic is really going to be a framing topic, which is the sort of concept of a research versus an experiential lab. Uh, I'll explain what, uh, what I mean by that uh, a little bit more um, when we get there. And uh, from there, we'll go into some common lab buildouts. So just typical setups that we see on a, on a regular basis that are being, you know, implemented at academic labs as well as, you know, more uh, corporate research and development labs as well. Um, from there, we're going to do a really quick sneak peek at this uh, lab configurator tool that we've built that's going to allow people to uh, effectively do a little bit of online shopping, getting uh, an idea of, of the rough order of cost of different pieces. And uh, from there, we'll get really into the meat of the webinar, which is the hardware rundown. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about VR headsets, uh, different kinds of trackers and sensors. Um, we'll be showing some projectors and how they work in a virtual environment. And uh, a lot of this is actually going to revolve around a live demonstration where Felix and I are going to have more of a conversational style of, uh, you know, walking through a number of different VR pieces live on camera. So uh, after that, there'll be a really pretty brief consideration for software. We won't be getting too much into that in this topic. Uh, it's really more of a hardware focus and kind of giving you guys the full spectrum view of uh, what's out there in the world right now. And then uh, after that, we'll have our Q&A section. And if you guys have never joined us for uh, Q&A, uh, it's pretty fun because what we do is we actually are taking your questions throughout this presentation and we are copying and pasting the questions into a slide at the very end and we will go through those questions one by one and answer them as best we can in the time that we have uh, we're going to try and keep this under an hour um, in terms of just the core content and then have about 15 minutes afterwards for the q a so uh, i would imagine that would go we're on the west coast here so pacific time q a is probably going to go from about 10 to 10 15. Um, if you have to drop out early we will be posting a recording of this webinar uh, but we also have a survey that goes out uh, when you exit the webinar. And uh, if you want us to talk about any topics or follow up with you in any way, um, or there's anything that you'd like to see more of in the future from our webinars, uh, that's really the place to let us know. So please do fill out that, that survey at the end. Um, we'll really, uh, we, we read those responses very closely and uh, it's gonna help inform the way that we would do this in the future. So, um, I'm going to just jump in, give you guys a little bit of background here on WorldBiz. So we've been doing, um, we've been working in the VR space for, for close to 20 years now. Uh, really, where we come from is an academic background. Uh, the technology that became our core technology was first developed at a lab at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and that sort of academic focus and academic background, uh, primarily in psychology, has informed um, all of the work that we've done in the last 20 years. Uh, our core customers have traditionally really been mostly academic users who are using our tools for software, for uh, research um, in psychology, human perception, computer science and computer vision. So that's been a kind of core focus of our business, but uh, we've also taken those learnings and those ideas into the, the more corporate and government spheres as well. So uh, we'll be kind of going back to our roots here, talking a lot about academic research, but this is definitely gonna have um, applications uh, for business users as well. So uh, we're gonna be talking about all sorts of different third-party pieces today. It's, uh, it's not gonna be really focused on, on exactly what we do, but it's definitely gonna be informed by the kinds of solutions that we provide. Um, just to give you guys an idea of the kinds of products and things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, basis as a business, 
Uh, we really are a software uh, platform producer. We have two software tools. One is a, a drag and drop VR creation tool, and the other is a, a Python based tool called Wizard. Um, we also are an in house production studio where we develop our own custom applications. Uh, all three of these topics aren't really going to be touched on today, just to kind of give you guys a little background on, on, on us. But what we will be talking about today is our sort of integrated hardware solutions background. So uh, what we do is we actually have some proprietary technology revolving around motion tracking. Um, but what we do even more than that is bring other pieces from, from manufacturers, display manufacturers, uh, folks who are building things like biofeedback and data gloves. And we bring those all together into one sophisticated kind of integrated system. So we'll be talking about the pieces that would go into one of those integrated systems and how they really work together. Um, because what's cool about this is that we're gonna be looking at how all of these different pieces can really plug into each other and create this sophisticated, uh, seamless end user experience. So with that in mind, uh, let's jump in to uh, this sort of framing mechanism that we've come up with here. Um, when we're working with academic customers and also business case users, uh, we're really seeing two main types of VR lab. And I would break that out as a research focused lab versus an experiential lab. In a research lab, your focus is really gonna be on data collection. So the hardware that you choose is informed by the requirements that you have for data collection. An experiential lab, on the other hand, is gonna be a space that's really about the group experience of VR content. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of overlap between these two categories, but it's kind of helpful to just have that in mind as you're starting out about what your main goal is. You know, for a research lab, for example, there will be times where, you know, you'll have visitors to your lab and it becomes an experiential space. And then for uh, an experiential lab, you know, if you're doing some kind of uh, work on virtual learning and how effective these types of collaboration technologies work, you are doing research, but you know, you're kind of leading with your, your experiential foot first. So let's look a little bit more in detail about what these different topics entail. Um, for a research lab, this is really gonna be driven by specific research goals, right? If you've got um, uh, an experiment that you're running over and over again with the sample population, um, you know, you've got an idea in your mind of what, you're, what the thesis that you're trying to prove is. Um, traditionally, we're really seeing more single user setups, just like this kind of desktop setup that we have a picture of here. Um, and then a lot of times you're also going to have folks adding different uh, external sensors or devices that are going to give you more detail about what a user's doing in the space. So, for example, maybe gloves to give realistic hand interaction or a haptic device uh, to give realistic force feedback for some kind of activity. So, a research lab, typically what we're seeing, single user, but uh, these are also starting to become more multi-user as well, as we're seeing uh, that technology has become a lot more flexible and, and easy to implement than, than it was a, a few years ago. So it's definitely grown in the research space, but just in the you know strictly traditional sense, we'd say this is probably a single user world. Um, if we're talking about what makes a experiential lab, that's really the inverse. You know, you're, you're thinking about group experience. Uh, that could be multiple headsets coming together in the same shared virtual environment, um, or it could be a large scale display where a lot of people are coming together and viewing and interacting with virtual reality content in these kind of uh, what we call projection systems. You know, traditionally they might be called caves. Um, we call them projection VR, uh, and that's something we'll be talking about in detail today. But really, the <clears throat> the key thing to keep in mind for an experiential lab is you know the content is coming first and the hardware that you're selecting is usually in service of connecting these users in a seamless VR experience. So that's uh, hopefully a little bit of a, of a framing mechanism that you guys can um, um, identify with. And just to check, we actually, this is our first poll right here. Um, and I'd just love to know a little bit about uh, the audience members and, and how you guys are, are, if you are identifying with this uh, overview, um, if you could go ahead and, and let us know if you're trying to build a research lab or an experience center, 
we can, to a, to a certain extent, um, go ahead and uh, add some uh, clarity within this presentation talking about, you know, hey, this is, this is a, a more of a experience center type idea or a research lab, but uh, yeah, thank you everyone who's, who's participated in this poll right now. This is super helpful. Like I said, we can adjust our messaging on the fly a little bit here, and it looks like a lot of you, as I'm seeing this come in, mostly research. All right, this is awesome. So hopefully this is making sense to you guys um, in terms of, of, a, of a framing mechanism. Um, we've got about 60% participation on the poll. Um, since we got a lot to cover here, I'm just gonna go ahead and close and publish this poll. So as you guys can see, uh, primarily a research lab is, is definitely the leader, but then mostly experiential with some research aspects is coming in. And if you combine that with the uh, mostly research with some experience aspects, we're definitely getting a, a, a nice mix there. I'd be curious to know, uh, you know, if you guys wanna let us know in the survey uh, what something else entirely means to you, uh, we'd love to hear that. Um, but let's go ahead and jump into some common lab build outs just to give you guys a little bit more of an idea of, of how we see these different concepts in action. Yeah. So we'll start with the research labs. And really the entry level research lab build out is just gonna be your straight up consumer headset plus a computer. Uh, when we say a consumer headset, we really mean a VR headset that was designed primarily for playing video games. So that would be you know, the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive. Uh, Sato is going to talk a little bit more about that, but what's really cool and what a lot of people don't really know about these uh, headsets is that you can get a ton of data out of a headset just right out of the box. Uh, the headsets are all motion tracked, so you're going to get um, the person's head orientation. Uh, you can combine that with the simulation data to actually uh, get an idea of what their gaze direction is. Uh, you can set up different trackers in the environment to um, have a uh, information on what type of interactivity a person's doing. So all of those pieces are really just available, you know, even at your fundamental Oculus Rift level. Um, and it's just good to keep in mind, you know, to know what types of data you can get out of a VR headset just on its own. Uh, from there, depending on what your research goals are, uh, you're going to start looking at different things that you can add on to really give you more clarity in the data that you're trying to gather for your specific research goal. Uh, I would say the most typical sensor add-ons that we're seeing uh, are eye tracking, which is usually built directly into the VR headset and building off of the idea of gaze data that you're getting from where a person's looking, eye tracking is actually gonna give you clarity into the individual objects in a scene. Biofeedback is you know, exactly what it sounds like. It's giving you the physio data on a user, things like heart rate and skin conductance. And then data gloves, as you can see in this picture, are, as opposed to a, a traditional VR controller like these things that we have down here, are actually going to model the user's hand in the virtual environment. So all of these things could come together to create, uh, you know, a more sophisticated setup than just your, your standard consumer headset. Uh, Sato is actually going to be talking about these pieces in detail in just a few minutes. But just wanted to kind of give you guys an idea, you know, if we're talking about a single user system, this is usually where people are starting. If we're kind of going up to the next sort of mid-level system, uh, this is what we would traditionally call a walking lab. Um, you know, a wide area environment where there's some kind of uh, higher end motion tracking than just the type that's included out of the box with a, with a VR gaming system. So, you know, something like a, a motion tracking system shown here uh, or a motion capture system. Um, and that's really going to be giving you a lot more information about where a user is in the environment or and all the way down to their um, you know gait kinematic data if you're doing some sort of kinesiology research uh, those are important things to be looking at um, a lot of times what we'll do in these sort of large area uh, high precision walking environments is we'll have different co-located users right so you can have multiple users who have an absolute position with each other um, and that's really based on the type of tracking technology that you're using. So we'll be talking a little bit more about this in, in the future, but just kind of keeping in mind that, you know, from the consumer system, you can move up by adding a, uh, a more advanced tracking solution for either motion capture or wide area motion tracking. 
this is a topic that we won't be able to get into too much detail today, um, just because we're limited in terms of, of our total time. But uh, this is going to be your kind of specialty display and specialty build outs. Um, there's all sorts of really awesome uh, and cool new displays. For example, this is a, what we would call a light field display, which is going to create a hologram image in, a, in an environment. There's other things like auto stereoscopic displays, which are, you know, 3D displays uh, that don't need a glasses or a um, or any kind of uh, a VR headset to see. Uh, so we've built systems that are compatible with MRI machines. You know, uh, we've brought in things like treadmills uh, for a large scale projection system. And uh, this is this is a topic that that we'll definitely be covering in more detail in a future webinar. But just to kind of give you guys uh, a sneak peek about that, um, one of the things that that you might consider uh, would be, you know, is there a requirement for a more advanced display than just the type of things that we're traditionally using in, in in the VR headset realm, right? For example, the projection systems that we'll be talking about in more detail in a second. Uh, they actually don't require a user to wear a headset. They're just wearing lightweight 3D glasses. So if you wanted to use like an EEG cap, for example, on a user and get some, some data about their brain activity, that might be a system that you'd look at. Um, we'll talk a little bit about augmented reality and how that can play into research and why you might select that over a virtual reality system um, and how those things are uh, actually pretty interrelated. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the kind of future of, of displays that aren't projected, more tiled displays and LED uh, screen type experiences. So that's just a little bit of a sneak preview on the on the uh, specialty display topic. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and jump into the experiential lab. So this is kind of a fun picture here. Uh, you know, an experiential lab, usually what we're seeing in its most basic version is a number of VR headset users connected. They can be co-located, like we were talking about in the previous sort of research uh, walking lab. Um, co-located really means like, if I'm in a VR headset and you're in a VR headset, we're in the same room, we're absolute position. When I reach out, I can actually physically touch you in that space, um, even though we're in a virtual shared environment. Uh, that's one version. The other version would be everybody's kind of connected in their own world, but we're in relation to each other in that virtual world. Um, so maybe we're in different rooms, maybe we're in different states or different countries, um, but that's a more of a remote collaboration type application, which we've actually done a, a pretty detailed webinar in the past if you guys wanna go and check out our YouTube channel after this. Um, but the idea here is really just uh, a series of networked consumer-based systems is your standard kind of low-level uh, experiential app. So you just get, uh, computer and headset for every user that you want to have, and then build out your lab accordingly. Um, on the other side of the experiential lab is going to be the more projected solutions. So a projection system is just going to give a, a virtual environment that is, uh, you know, shown on a wall. It can be in 3D, it can be in 2D, but as you can see, you have an audience that's able to experience uh, this content and in a large scale way. Um, this uh, system up here is actually showing uh, what we'll be showing a little bit during our live demo, which is how you can actually use a projection system to output or mirror the display of a VR headset user. Um, so that's one thing that we see people do a lot is using these projection systems actually as a way for a group of people to join a, or, or observe a VR headset user um, while they're in a simulation, right? So uh, you'll actually get a firsthand look at uh, how that looks and feels in uh, a few minutes here when we do our live demo. But just wanted to kind of give you guys an idea of how these different lab setups are working. And with that in mind, we actually have our second poll already. Um, and this is going to just kind of, in the same way that our first poll uh, worked, just kind of ask you guys what what here is is really speaking to you the most in terms of a system that you might want to be using in your lab? Um, are we talking about an individual consumer system that, uh, with a heavy research focus? Um, just let us know in this poll uh, what you're what you're looking at and uh, hoping to build or, or maybe have already built. So 
So this is super helpful for us because then we can also tailor a little bit more about uh, the content of our presentation towards where you guys are, are, um, are going. <clears throat> While we've got that poll going, uh, I also just wanted to give you guys the sneak peek of the WorldBiz VR configurator. So I'll go ahead and open that up right now. And this is a system that we just put together. Um, it's really a beta version and we would love your feedback. Uh, you should be able to see the URL in my presentation here. But uh, what this is, is a, a sort of a la carte menu for different VR components. We've given rough order of magnitude pricing for the North American market for each of these different pieces, but this is gonna give you all a uh, detailed look at the kind of pricing spectrum and the different key components that you might wanna include in your lab. So all the things that we're talking about today, you'll be able to find on this WorldBiz VR Configurator website, and you'll actually be able to build your own um, rough price estimate just based on all of the, the different pieces that we'll be talking about today. So uh, we'll try and talk about pricing a little bit, but this is going to be a good way for you all to kind of get, get online and start thinking about how these pieces might come together. Um, and of course, if you guys have any questions about, you know, what we're talking about here, there are, is a lot of ground to cover. So um, we'll be happy to answer individual questions that you have at a later date. So let me go ahead and share out these results here. Um, a lot of you are looking to build individual consumer systems with a heavy research focus. That's great. I think that's really where we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of our, our uh, uh, a lot of our um, core customers are working. So um, that's that's perfect because Sato is about to jump into uh, the key components for those systems right now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out the uh, poll and hand this over to Sato, and he's gonna talk about uh, you know, the world of VR headsets, and then also the, the most common kind of research data gathering peripherals that, that we work with. So let me go ahead and uh, pass this over to Sato now. Um, get my, here we go. There you go, Sato, you should have that. And I'm also gonna stop sharing these poll results. Okay, thanks, Dan. So before I jump into talking about some of the uh, current available VR headsets, I wanted to quickly just go over a few uh, specification terms and um, give you an overview of what they mean. So first up, it's a field of view or FOV. So I assume that everyone's familiar with this term, but this refers to how much of an environment is viewable, usually measured diagonally in a forward facing arc. So for humans, this uh, roughly lies at a little over 210 degrees. Although where your two eyes um, overlap and where we have 3D stereo vision is only around 114 degrees. So this this is where most of the action takes place. Um, interesting to note also that the uh, we actually have varying fields of view for different colors. And um, some scenarios where field of view may be important would be um, something like a maze walking task where the user needs to avoid obstacles that are not directly in their line of sight, as well as uh, search related tasks or just increase overall immersion. So to increase the field of view in a headset, you either could move the lenses closer to your head. So some headsets have that ability that you can uh, adjust the distance of the lenses, or you could have bigger lenses. Um, there's also some consideration on the thickness of the lenses as well. And also it's good to keep in mind that larger lenses can increase optical aberrations and can cause some warping and distortion around the edges, as well as uh, increase the weight of the headset. And additionally, a, a larger field of view may also increase nausea if you're, for instance, moving with a controller as our peripheral vision is more sensitive to movement, um, but that also the nausea could be affected by the warping I just mentioned as well. And um, currently the, the largest field of view that I'm aware of in a VR headset is the uh, 210 degree field of view of the Star VR1 headset. Although the uh, Pimax and VR Geneers are um, at 200 degrees and 180 degrees respectfully. 
and then this is a just a quick comparison of some of the fields of view of some of the current headsets the valve index actually is fairly large too 130 and then this is a rift s at 110 which is kind of like the uh, sort of like the norm for the more consumer based headsets um, up next i want to briefly discuss visual clarity and how that relates to to pixel density as well as screen types and um, this may be an important consideration if you have an application that requires for instance a user to read small text or notice smaller details um, perhaps in something like a flight simulator where there are knobs and panels and so uh, pixels per degree it combines the uh, pixel density in in pixels per inch and the distance to the display as well so for headsets, this is also dependent not only on the resolution, but the field of view, as well as the sub-pixel arrangement that is tied to the display type as well. And to get a general range, um, for someone with 20-20 vision, they have a pixel per degree of around 60 in the center. Most consumer current consumer headsets vary from around like 11 to 14 pixels per degree. Um, but this is the, the Varjo headset actually has a pixel per degree of 60 in the center of the lens. So that's um, showing that right there, this screenshot showing the difference. Although to get a more complete picture, you really have to take into account the screen type because uh, there are two main screen types in the VR headset. So there's LCD, RGB, and OLED pentile types. And uh, LCD screens are sharper just because they have three sub-pixels for each pixel, one for red, green, and blue while Pentile have just two. So there's one for green, and then there's one that's split between red and blue. And um, But the downside to LCD is actually that the blacks appear to be more washed out and the colors are slightly less, less vivid. Um, if you could see the slide here, well, on your monitor, you could see on the left, um, the LCD screen, you could see like the text there. It's a little bit sharper, but the uh, the blacks are a bit washed out. And this is actually due to the, the brightness of the LEDs that are used as the light source in the, those types of screens. And then lastly, uh, lens design can also affect pixel density. So for instance, the Oculus um, tends to have more overlap in the center with the higher pixel density, while the, the Vive headsets have a more even distribution. And uh, lower pixel density can increase what is known as like the screen door effect, where it looks like you're viewing the world through a mesh screen and can make images just appear a bit more blurry overall. And um, additionally, you can you can use now what is called super sampling to increase visual clarity, but I don't have time to get into all the details of that right now, other than uh, it's an option also you can look into. And lastly, to go over a uh, refresh rate, which is how many times per second a screen will refresh its image. And while various headsets may have higher maximum refresh rates, you also may have a bottleneck with your graphics card just limiting the frame rate that is rendered. And lower refresh rates may cause um, perceived latency, which can contribute to nausea also. So it's actually much more noticeable if you have fluctuations in frame rate than a consistently lower one. So this is why, for instance, Oculus um, uses something called asynchronous space warp, which will limit the frame rate to 45 Hertz when it can't achieve a consistent 90 Hertz. And higher rates can uh, improve the smoothness of visuals and human vision can detect frame rates of up to around a thousand Hertz, although there are diminishing returns above around 150 Hertz. And right now the highest refresh rate that uh, is in the consumer headsets is the, the valve index has 144 hertz. And a couple other things you might consider when comparing VR headsets. So when you're kind of specking out which one is going to fit your purpose the best is these are some uh, other things you might want to keep in mind is the weight of the headset as well as the distribution of the weight, which kind of relates to how comfortable it's going to feel on your head. Um, the tracking type, so inside out versus external. So inside out, um, trackers just have cameras that are embedded in the headset. And so this doesn't restrict you to your tracking area. So you can move from one room to another, one location to another, and then can pretty much be good to go in a couple of minutes while external camera systems require you to set up cameras, map out your tracking space. Um, but then they, they can have a high level of accuracy and stability. And uh, 
another consideration is whether a headset is PC or standalone, as uh, PC-based headsets are tethered to a PC with higher performance and standalone, or um, as it sounds, it's, it's an all-in-one device with lower performance. And uh, lastly, you might want to consider the price. So now that we understand a bit, bit about some of the specifications, I'm going to highlight really briefly the current PC consumer-based headsets, as well as some of the higher-end ones. And so these consumer-based headsets, they're all fairly similar with, with some slight differences that might be important to a researcher based off of certain criteria. So the Oculus Rift S is um, probably the most affordable out of these consumer headsets. It's at, 100, at $400. And it has inside out tracking and uh, LCD screens. It doesn't have a physical uh, knob to adjust the distance between your pupils. That's called interpupillary distance. So if, for instance, the distance between your pupils or someone that's going to be running uh, simulations in your lab's pupils, if those if their distances varies a lot above or below the default, then you would have to go into the software and adjust the IPD. So that's one consideration with that headset. Um, the Oculus Quest is actually a pretty popular option now due to uh, the fact that it can function as both a standalone headset or you can connect it now to your PC with the Oculus Link update. The field of view and the refresh rate are a little bit lower than the Rift S and it's um, similar in price. It's $400 and it's uh, got a pretty good like high resolution screen. I mean, I'd say the two main workhorses right now currently are the Vive Pro and the Rift. S. The Vive Pro has uh, similar specs in regards to resolution and field of view as a Rift S, but it uses dual MOLED screens, and also it uses the Lighthouse tracking with external cameras, and it also now has the eye tracking version, which I'm going to explain a little bit later. Um, it's a little higher in price. It's uh, about $1,200 for the full kit. This is the, the Vive Cosmos line. Um, so it's a newer line from Vive. It has dual LCD panels, slightly higher resolution, inside out tracking. And um, there's four different models. So there's a standard one that has six cameras for inside out tracking. There's the, the Play version, which has just four cameras. And um, there's the Elite, which actually uses Lighthouse tracking. And then there's also an XR version coming out soon, which would add augmented reality, which I'll discuss a bit later. And um, Valve has their own headset, the Valve Index. It's this one here down in the bottom. It's a pretty high performance headset with, as I mentioned, the high refresh rate at 144 hertz, a wide field of view at 130 degrees, and also uses the Valve knuckle controllers for finger tracking. So if you're willing to pay a little bit more for a wider field of view and get those higher specs, um, the full system for a Valve Index is about $1,000. And keep in mind that none of these prices um, include the high powered PC you will need to power these headsets. And then this here is just showing the HP Reverb, which this is part of the Windows Mixed Reality line of headsets. So that's um, a lot of, consists of headsets they all use inside out tracking. Um, and this HP Reverb one is uh, actually a 4K headset. And then these are some of the uh, higher end models. Um, so this is the VR Juniors XTAL, so it has 180 degree field of view, 5K built-in eye tracking, built-in leap motion support. Uh, Varjo, I mentioned, mentioned earlier, it says the human eye resolution in the center fovea part of the headset at 60 pixels per degree, built-in eye tracking, also augmented reality capabilities. And this Pimax one is probably out of the three, the one that's a little bit more consumer focused. They have an 8K and a 5K version, 200 degree field of view, and they all of these use the lighthouse tracking. And now really quick um, to go over some of the eye tracking enabled headsets. So combining eye tracking and uh, virtual reality is growing in popularity and um, provides benefits for things such as training, marketing, research, um, diagnostics of health conditions, and uh, foveated rendering. So this is something where you could render the sharpest resolution only where a user is looking within a scene. And uh, some of the main VR headsets to provide eye tracking include this, the Vive Pro I, which is a 1600 for the full system, or you can get just a headset for around 850. So where there used to be a pretty high entry 
priced entry point eye tracking and VR has uh, now been reaching the consumer level. And the sample rate on this one is 120 hertz for the eye tracking, and it's provided by Toby. And then this down here is a device from Pupil Labs, which this one's convenient in that it can be placed into an existing headset. So basically, it could just be popped in there. You could see the external cameras in there. So this can be put into a Vive or a Vive Pro. And then they have a 200 hertz just a sampling rate. Okay, now I'm going to go on to um, briefly discuss augmented reality headsets, just really quick. Um, AR has been developing a little slower than VR with some some VR headsets, like I mentioned, the Varjo and the upcoming Cosmos XR, allowing the ability to go between both. So that's just the term XR. Um, so an example, maybe when you want to use augmented reality or, or mixed reality is when you either need to interact with real world objects or where you want to see the real world environment around you possibly. And then you have holograms that you can interact with that are overlaid on top of that. So for standalone um, full AR headsets, there's the HoloLens 2, Nreal, Magic Leap 1, and then the Apple Glass that's rumored right now. So all of these headsets are still in development. There's no consumer versions of these available yet. And these devices um, tend to be standalone, and then they also tend to have a fairly limited field of view. WorldViz also offers an augmented reality pass-through device <clears throat> that can be mounted onto any headset called a video vision. It's a, so you can inquire about that. I'm not gonna have too much time to go into detail on any of these in particular. And we also have support for something called AR Toolkit, which just, just lets you uh, display holograms on printed fiduciary markers, which is like a little kind of pattern that you print out and then it can be overlaid when you view it through a webcam. And uh, one device <clears throat> that is particularly interesting is a coalescent system from Collins Aerospace. Um, this merges the virtual world with the real world objects, and you can have people overlaid, <clears throat> and it uses a green screen masking technique. So the device itself is uh, attached to a Vive Pro. And so I'm going to play this video really quick. Just give me one second. I guess I had the audio on that. So, so yeah, you could see um, it's kind of looks like it's just a real like environment because that's using photogrammetry, envir photogrammetry environment, and that's actually uh, just showing just the green screen. So this is over overlapping the virtual world. So let me just play that again really quick. Yeah, so that's the uh, coalescent system. And uh, another popular tool for researchers in regards to uh, data collection with virtual reality is using uh, physiological measurements. <clears throat> this is a uh, pretty powerful in that it provides more insight into what is perceived, not just what is seen. So by measuring <clears throat> metrics such as heart rate, skin conductance, and EEG, a researcher can get a more complete picture of the implicit reactions to a stimulus or someone measuring the effectiveness of a training can see how a user's state of arousal or attention correlates to a better retention of learning new training skills. And also you can have the virtual world respond and change due to changes in a physiological measurement, such as having a ball that rises or falls based on your heart rate for doing things like biofeedback therapy. And uh, one of the more common systems that um, that we recommend, recommend a lot of our clients use are the Biopack physiological measurement systems. So this is the Acknowledge software here. It um, combines with their modules to let users accurately acquire and display and measure and an analyze physiological signals. And um, our software Vizard connects to Acknowledge, so that with just a few lines of code, you can see how things that happen in the virtual world match up with physio measurements using just a few lines of code. 
And uh, just give me one second here. I'm going to go into data gloves. Okay, so now on to uh, data gloves. So for certain uh, training and rehabilitation scenarios or where you want to have um, finger tracking as well as hand tracking, and um, you may wish to possibly use gestures as inputs to control a simulation or interact with the objects. So this is where data gloves could come in handy. And usually these gloves consist of some sort of uh, flex sensors to measure finger flexion and uh, IMUs for rotational position on the fingers, as well as like some form of haptic feedback. And pictured right here is the Thermanis VR Prime 2 gloves. So this is the newest version of the Manus VR gloves, which is one of the more popular data gloves used in VR today. Then there's also the, the Prime 2 haptic, which adds more haptic feedback sensors to each finger. And so the Prime 2 now actually has uh, 11 degrees of freedom on each finger. So you can have things like abduction or spreading of your fingers. And there's also automatic filters to prevent drift on the, in, the inertial motion sensors. Um, the batteries are interchangeable, a faster calibration for and multi-user calibration, a universal mounting system, and now they're also uh, washable. And there's a lot of gloves on the market. There's always new ones coming out, as well as some older ones that are still sometimes used today, like the Cyber Glove and 5DT. There are also uh, camera-based options like the Leap Motion, and now what Oculus has built in with the Oculus Quest. And so really, really quick, these are some things you may consider when selecting data gloves or um, how you'll be tracking the hands, because usually if you just have positional tracking for the hands, you need to add, I mean, just rotational tracking on the fingers, you need to add some way of having positional tracking as well. So you get six degrees of freedom. So um, for instance, the Manus gloves can come with these uh, Vive trackers, then that will give you the position and rotational tracking. and um, and they have the universal amounts so you can use different type of tracking systems as well. Um, if you're moving around, you're probably going to want your gloves to be wireless. So then making sure you have enough battery life and that your gloves are charged. And as I mentioned, those new Menace gloves have interchangeable batteries. They have about five hours of battery life. Um, latency or how fast the gloves respond to physical movement, um, how large of a field of view there is with the tracking. So for instance, with the camera-based solutions, you might have some issues with occlusion if you don't have a direct line of sight to your hands, um, how comfortable they are, and they can be used with multiple type shaped hands or maybe have different sizes that you need, um, as well as uh, hygienics, which I guess that's more important now than ever. So as I mentioned, the Manus gloves are washable, so that's something you want to keep in mind and how you can sanitize them, and then what type of haptics you might need and, and the resolution of the haptics. And then also, how you're able to, to add the glove to simulation and things that you need to do in the code for things such as grabbing and interacting with objects. And so our software wizard um, can really quickly add data gloves. So you can do things to enable like a gesture-based input, grabbing, interacting with objects. And then lastly, a calibration is also something to consider. And then I'm just going to really quickly just show this example. This is just interacting with some objects using a physics-based um, interaction. So this is just collision boxes on your fingers and these objects. So you can kind of just interact with any of these objects using your fingers. And with that, I think we're going to go to the third poll. So this is uh, what matters to you the most when choosing VR hardware. Yeah, and I just opened up the poll for everybody. So um, it'd be awesome to get your feedback on what you're uh, looking for here. Um, definitely, you know, uh, considering what type of data you're capturing and how consistent and high quality that needs to be. Um, one one key piece of that and then ease of use as well so thanks so much Sato for for that presentation on uh on different headsets and and augmented reality and biofeedback and also on on the data gloves 
Um, definitely a lot of content to cover here, as, as uh, I mentioned at the outset. Um, so we're still collecting a couple of poll question, uh, poll responses now. Um, looks like we've got everybody. I'm going to go ahead and close it out and uh, share the screen. So um, definitely quality of data captured is in the lead with a close second of ease of use, uh, followed by affordability. So that's great to know. You know, um, I think uh, if we dive into the details on that, you know, obviously we can answer any questions that you have about different types of data that's captured. We've already gotten a question in our chat about um, eye tracking data and how that's captured. So I'll be talking to that during the Q&A section. I've actually queued up a couple of resources to show you all about that. But uh, what we're going to do now is we're actually going to transition into the live demo section of our presentation. So um, let's go ahead and uh, we'll have Felix join us live from our uh, tech lab in Santa Barbara. And um, now hey, you can see Felix. Hey, how's it going, Felix? Pretty good, pretty good. Awesome. So uh, give me one second while I just uh, take care of a couple things here. Um, just going to go ahead and turn off our screen sharing so we can full screen you. Awesome. So Felix, uh, why don't we go ahead and, uh, and, and jump right in? You've got a ton of equipment around you. So we're really excited to show, uh, show the folks at home uh, a little bit of the stuff that we work with every day. Um, maybe we'll, we'll, work our, we'll work our way from the outside in. Do you want to start by explaining a little bit about what's going on on the walls behind you? Sure. Um, so I'm uh, at the, our tech lab here in, uh, at our headquarters in Santa Barbara. Uh, and behind me, you can see uh, the, the, the projection system, those projectors up on the ceiling uh, that project the, the image onto the wall here, uh, allowing us to uh, view the, the virtual environment through essentially like uh, a window in like into the virtual world here. So there are like uh, ultra short story projectors like you know like they project the image in a very steep angle onto uh, the the walls here. So I can stand in front of the uh, on the screen and not cast the shadow, uh, which is um, a very neat technology because uh, uh, it allows uh, to uh, reduce the footprint of a system like this uh, compared to a more traditional cave system. Definitely. And I think it's worth pointing out that Felix is actually pretty tall. So uh, the image itself is quite tall. Um, so when Felix is standing in front of it, we're, we're talking about a, you know, nine to 10 foot tall image here per, per side. Um, one thing I think, Felix, that's worth pointing out, uh, the content that we're looking at right now is in 2D, correct? Correct. Uh, this is uh, like only a 2D uh, image right now. So, uh, so for you to see, um, if it's if it was in 3D, uh, you would need uh, these kind of uh, shutter glasses that are similar to what you have in the 3D movie theater uh, that allow then the user to uh, view the content in in 3D. So this is really similar to a VR headset system. Just instead of having everything enclosed in a in a headset, the image is on the wall. Could you talk a little bit about the kind of tracking aspects and interactivity aspects for this system? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as you were saying, like uh, the the headset is very similar to a headset. Um, so the the main user is being tracked. Um, like we have like this tracking bar on top of the glasses here uh, that then uh, allows the image to uh, the system to distort the image according to the viewpoint. Uh, I was going to that into detail in that uh, in a previous webinar. So you can, uh, if you want to see this live in action, you can uh, uh, go to our YouTube channel and uh, see it there. Um, but yeah, so uh, the uh, the main user is being tracked, uh, and according to uh, the movement, the image gets distorted. Uh, but there can be a number of users, uh, like you know, like standing around the main user uh, and view the uh, content in 3D uh, as well. And so there can be there can be a classroom, like you know, like there can be a teacher uh, with like a number of students that uh, are viewing the virtual environment. It can be like a design review or a number of decision makers um, well, view the the uh, virtual design here together. Um, where like you know, like not everybody wants to, and uh, sometimes it's just not feasible to have like you know, like uh, a large number of headsets uh, to like you know, like facilitate like a group experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe could you talk a little bit about the the main differences between this and a and a and a headset based experience? Yeah. So in a headset, uh, you're like you know, like fully immersed. Like you look up, you look down. Like uh, like you know, like all you see is the virtual environment. Uh, mm -hmm. In a projection system, like you know, like as I was saying, it's more like a window. Like I look down and I see the real floor here. The advantage is like you know, like without like on you know, like any major tracking technology, I still see my body, see my hands with a, with a headset. You need to add uh, additional uh, systems to be able to animate in uh, a virtual avatar. But yeah, so like uh, the projection system is not quite as immersive uh, because again, like as I said, like it's more like a window into the virtual environment. Um, but mm -hmm. it still is has a huge value if you want to have like uh, a group experience. Yeah, I would also add just for researchers, uh, there's lots of populations out there who can't wear VR headsets, right? So elderly populations, at-risk populations, the glasses that Felix is holding in his hands are a lot lighter weight than what you would have uh, with a VR headset. Um, so that might be something, you know, if you need access to a user's head for whatever reason or they can't wear a VR headset, something to consider a projection system in a research context. Um, speaking of headsets, Felix actually has a headset. Uh, right next to him and uh, Felix can you show us uh, how this is all connected right now sure like um so the the way I have it set up right now is uh, you can see here um, on my left side uh, like I'm like this is the first person view of this headset so like as I move around this headset uh, like I'm like the, you, you can see uh, it looking around in the virtual environment uh, and on the right side here, uh, I have a static viewpoint uh, that is essentially like uh, an overview, giving you an overview. So you can see here the headset uh, is represented as uh, a virtual head in the environment and uh, depending on where I move, uh, our motion tracking systems uh, essentially like, you know, like moving the virtual head in this environment. And we have done systems with like, you know, like multiple headsets in the same space as uh, a, a projection system, so you can combine those two together, uh, and again, like have uh, the individual experience together with the group experience. Mm, yeah, so this is really, you know, an experiential space that we're that we're looking at right now. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is we are still in the midst of a global pandemic, so we're obeying strict social distancing rules. Um, so rather than have another person in there with Felix, we've actually brought a physical mannequin in. Um, so the mannequin is wearing a different type of tracking system than the one that's on the VR headset, uh, a more traditional motion capture system. So Felix, do you mind uh, showing us a little bit about what's going on with the mannequin right now? Sure. So um, I guess like just to show you really quick, um, I can wear the headset and I have a, a controller here uh, that is represented as a, a virtual hand. Uh, and I can go over uh, to uh, my mannequin here, Manny, uh, and can like, you know, like shake his hand and you can see like, you know, like his arms animated. I can tap him on the shoulder. So like there's a one-to-one one -to -one relation between like the physical um, mm -hmm. uh, mannequin or like, you know, like this could be uh, a user, another user wearing this like motion capture suit uh, and, uh, and myself here. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, really illustrating the sort of different types of tracking technology that's going on here. You can see Felix is holding the head uh, of his, you know, effectively he's only tracking his head and hand. So that's what we're seeing on that fixed perspective viewpoint, uh, whereas we have the whole body of the mannequin in the environment. And um, I think what's really cool about this demonstration is that uh, you're effectively piping in live motion capture data into a projected environment. So if I was a motion capture actor, I could actually see myself in the VR space live um, with this uh, type of setup. So um, maybe Felix, you could talk just a second longer about motion capture versus you know what we would call motion tracking um, in, in terms of what types of data you're getting. Sure. So, like, I'm like, yeah, as you mentioned already, like in a motion tracking system, uh, like, I'm like, you only uh, typically only track like uh, the head position or like a controller or like uh, in another prop. We have like you know, done any number of uh, props that we built in uh, where we built in like a motion tracking device uh, with a motion capture suit. Uh, like, you know, like we have a number of trackers all on like on like uh, this. 
uh, this mannequin here, and like you see the individual trackers here, uh, and they give you six degrees of freedom data. They give you position and orientation, and by placing them like on like on uh, all the major limbs uh, and around uh, the major joints, uh, it allows the, the software to calculate like on like how like on like the arm is moving and how it's bending. And uh, yeah, so like it gives a uh, like a full picture here of uh, the uh, animated mannequin here. Awesome. So I guess just to kind of give people an idea of what we're looking at, you know, from a high level, there's three different systems at play, right? Um, could you explain kind of each each one and, and what's required here? Sure. So like we have a, a system that is doing like you know like the headset and like uh, doing the rendering of, of the headset and then we have like, you know, like our projection system like you know that could be a projection uh, system user here uh, like you know, like wearing these glasses uh, in here together with the project uh, with the headset user and in addition to that that can be uh, another uh, user like you know, like wearing the head uh, wearing the motion capture suit which is like the third system. Uh, and that could also, like, you know, like that user could also be wearing uh, either a headset or, like, you know, like the uh, the three D shutter glasses. So, like, the three systems here are projection system, uh, HMD, and uh, the mocap suit here. Yeah. So it it might not be super uh, clear. It, it might come off as maybe almost trivial how all of these pieces are working together so seamlessly. But I think uh, the sort of secret to the success of this is the fact that we're connecting these things via software in the background, right? Yeah. So and again, like uh, you know, like with our software, like you know, like we have made a tool that is browser based, like you know, it doesn't require any coding uh to uh to integrate uh yeah, to interface with all these devices. So like, you know, like uh you can just um easily like you know, select okay, like I have like an XN suit here and I got like I have like uh my Oculus uh Oculus Rift H and D uh, and I have my projection system and um like you know you punch in a couple of like parameters because like you know, like every system is like you know, like different. Uh but uh, it makes it really easy to like, you know, like create a configuration and make uh, essentially like all these pieces work together in a very seamless fashion. Mm, perfect. Um, well, we're coming up on the end of the hour here, but we still have a little bit of ground to cover. So if you all uh, don't mind sticking around with us, um, we've got a couple more topics. Uh, one thing where we've got Felix live on camera, uh, all of these systems have their own rendering computer going on. Um, these days, you know, Felix, maybe you could talk about the the, the workstations that you have around you, and uh, especially the backpack. I think. Yeah, sure. So, like, you know, like there's uh, like you know, like any size, any form factors we have done, like you know, like server racks, or like you know, like uh, a number of servers are driving, like you know, like a uh, large scale projection system, but like you know, like you can have like a small form factor PC here driving a headset or or a, a laptop, like in our wrist box here. Um, yeah, as you were saying, like the uh, neat thing about like a backpack PC is like I'm like I have a very long cable here, um, but it is a cable, it's a tripping hazard, uh, and if you want to eliminate uh, the 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 cable and like you know, like walk a large space, uh, like the backpack PC is definitely a good uh, option. It has like you know, like uh, it's battery powered, like a laptop uh, has two batteries so that you can like you know, like swap one of them uh, out, like on the on the fly while like you know, like uh, you're in the uh, environment, uh, and you just like uh, connect the, the the headsets to it, and uh, you know, as I was saying, where like a backpack is fairly lightweight, uh, does not like you know, like uh, inhibit my my movement here. Uh, it's definitely a, a good option for like you know, like if you have a, a larger walking area. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think uh, we'll we'll kind of move on to some of these other uh, topics for just a second, but before we do that, um, we will be talking briefly about 360 degree cameras. And uh, just to give people at home an idea of what that looks like, uh, maybe you could kind of hold that up to the camera for us. Yeah, so I got the the Insta360 here, uh, and yeah, uh, so we're we are going to into detail like and like what this camera does, uh, but it's essentially capturing like a uh, like a uh, an, an a real environment, and, uh, and then allows it to bring us into the VR uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the scene in the background, if it's not clear from the robot avatar, is is a CG computer generated rendered scene. But um, you can also do real-world capture of environments with something like a 360 camera or even photogrammetry, which we'll talk about briefly. So awesome, Felix. Thank you so much. 
Um, we'll have to get this set up again because uh, the lighting looks great with all the pieces in front. Um, if anybody's got any questions about what we showed here, uh, shoot them our way. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, set up even a one-on-one -on -one, uh, demonstration with you all to give you an idea of, of what these technologies do. Um, I'm back on the presenter now, so you guys should be able to see my screen. Uh, one thing that I just wanted to show super briefly to kind of go along with that robot avatar tracking is that this is also technology that's available in a more consumer fashion. Um, so there's a video of Sato, and he's just wearing these Vive trackers that are actually working with uh, an HTC Vive Lighthouse system. And, you know, this might not be getting you the, the uh, absolutely, you know, perfect scientific data in terms of, um, you know, a person's movement, but this is going to be a really effective for doing things just like basic stride length calculation, something along those lines. Uh, you are getting a uh, good body data. So there's a whole world of, of tracking uh, technology out there uh, that we'll have to uh, talk about in more detail in an upcoming webinar. But a um, couple just brief topics that I'll touch on uh, really quickly here uh, is the VR treadmills. Um, this is one way that people might be able to walk through a virtual environment, so something like this Cyberinth. Uh, we've worked with these types of tools before. There's ones that are really more like exercise treadmills and then others that are, are more like these, these platforms here. Um, we'll be getting into that in our future webinar on specialty displays and, and uh, additional hardware. Uh, the other kind of big topic that we haven't had a lot of time to jump into today is haptic interfaces. Um, haptic devices, if we just kind of think about uh, uh, what their sort of main categories are. Uh, there's these really intense sort of force feedback ones. Um, and then there's also these more sort of lighter touch ones. So these can be used in surgery simulations and uh, really uh, what a haptic device does in effect is it, it creates force feedback for a user. So if you were watching the, the part of the presentation where Sato had a glove on uh, and he was kind of batting um, the, the uh, 3D objects back and forth, um, there's no force feedback when he touches the virtual object. So the haptic devices come in to fill in for that sort of uh, uh, gap in, in the user experience. Um, there's definitely limitations to this technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a new area to be working in, but something to keep in mind uh, as out there and available to you if your research is about touch, about physical interaction, right? Um, let me go ahead uh, and hand it back over to Sato. I'm just going to have Sato talk briefly about 360 cameras here because Sato's really done a lot of production for us. Uh, so Sato, do you mind talking for, for just a second about the camera that, that Felix was showing us? Oh, well, yeah, I was just going to say, so in general, it's 360 video is a, I mean, it's actually a really simple and easy asset. You can add um, either using here like a cheaper kind of 360 camera, like this gear 360 down here, which is around $130. It does 4K. Or you can even capture photospheres with your phone, or um, something more like a higher end would be like the Insta Pro 360. So this is the Insta Pro 360 2. And uh, to view 360 videos um, that are really high resolutions, you can actually um, use things like adaptive streaming, where it only renders the highest resolution where you're looking. Um, so I guess if you want to switch slides, I could just briefly go yeah. over some of the specs on this. So this uh, 360. Insta360 Pro 2 has real-time stitching, so that's something that used to take a lot of work to have to go and stitch all the videos together, but that can do that now in real time. Um, it can do up to 8K 3D video, <clears throat> or it can do uh, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second at a 6K or 4K, um, respectively, or 12K photos. It can do HDR video. Um, also, so you don't have to worry about being in the shot. You can do far range remote monitoring. So you could be far away and still control the camera. And they also have that uh, adaptive streaming um, built in with the crystal view, what they call it, dynamic playback. And um, yeah, so that's just really quickly, I mean, to go over some of the features of that particular camera. But like I said, there's also cheaper ones on the market like the Gear 360 or Rico Theta or the Views XR. So that's, uh, yeah. Skipped over the last slide. Awesome. Thank you, Sato. Yeah, I think, you know, 360 cameras, an awesome way to create content very quickly. Um, but you will be limited in the fact that, you know, it's just a, a, a bubble that the user's head is in uh, from where the space was captured. Um, 
if you're looking for another way, uh, another hardware-based production method, uh, photogrammetry is definitely something you need to look into. Um, this is something that we use extensively here at WorldViz. Um, you know, there's different types of rigs out there for creating photogrammetry, but uh, the very basic concept is the ability to take multiple pictures of an object, you know, a human being, uh, a small prop, and then using software to uh, stitch those pictures together into a uh, full 3D object. So it can actually assume the geometry of the object based on the overlap between the different pictures. So you can see this is kind of a homemade rig, but this is really getting more into like the professional style rigs with lots of DSLR cameras and things like that. Um, what's great about these tools is that, you know, there's bottlenecks in the production of VR content, especially for academic users uh, who might not have infinite resources in terms of uh, production. Um, and these are technologies that are really uh, you know, fast becoming accessible uh, to a wide variety of folks. Um, so between 360 cameras and, and um, you know, your own ability to create uh, CG assets through photogrammetry, uh, there's definitely some some cool hardware pieces out there that you should look into for production. Um, we'll, we'll try and get into this more in a future webinar topic as well. Um, but at this point, uh, I think we're going to jump into the Q&A. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. I haven't had the chance to copy all the questions that we've gotten over yet. Uh, so I've just got this first one. Um, and uh, a user asked, uh, could you mention something about the software used to analyze the eye tracking data? And I actually have something to show you all um, here, if you guys can still see my screen. Uh, this is an overview of our in-house eye tracking analytics lab. So, uh, but what I really just wanted to call people's attention to is this list right here of the different modifiable features that you can have when doing eye tracking research. Um, I'd be happy to send anybody this PDF. You can just go ahead and let us know in the, in the uh, uh, survey that, that you'd like a copy of this. Um, but uh, really sort of the, the, the key data is that you're, um, you know, how long uh, you're looking at an object, which is view time per object, how many views per object you're getting, uh, average view time per object. So these types of things, uh, you're marking objects within a scene, uh, uh, you know, virtual objects, mind you, that are then, um, whenever your eye intersects with it or focuses, uh, we're recording that, outputting it as maybe a bar chart or, you know, any different version of, of, um, of uh, data analysis tools. So uh, this, I believe, Sato has has done quite a bit of, uh, you know, background and even worked with uh, some of our partners, such as Biopack, uh, to produce some some sophisticated uh, uh, webinar information on this topic. So uh, if you have any questions about this, we'll follow up with some more information. But just wanted to show that to you uh, up front. Um, the other question that we got uh, is, give me one second here while I pull it up. Um, which XSend system are we using? And um, the XSend system is, uh, I believe, an XSend MVN Awinda. So uh, XSend is something to just mention about XSend compared to other types of motion capture systems out there. XSend is a um, what's called an inertial motion capture system. So there's inertial devices that are uh, inertial measurement. Um, units that are attached to the different joints. And that's giving you, um, you know, a little bit more flexibility in terms of how fast it is to calibrate the system compared to uh, like an optical system. So optical systems, many people would be familiar with if you've ever seen, you know, uh, how it's made for a video game or a, um, or a uh, movie. A lot of times people are wearing these motion capture suits that are covered in little uh, white balls. And those are reflective balls for infrared cameras. And that would be just what would broadly be considered an optical system. So some of the most common optical systems out there are gonna be OptiTrack, Vicon, and then OptoTrack. Um, so those are, those are all you know, um, focused on capturing similar types of data to the XSense system. Uh, XSense is um, really good for just its flexibility of use. Uh, you know, you're putting on a suit, like a Lycra suit, um, or even just not even a, a full suit, but just a little straps that you can then uh, get all the same types of kinematic data that you would be getting out of a motion capture system, but without some of the, the kind of hurdles that, that many people are encountering when using that type of hardware. Um, 
Will we cover Vizard software in more detail in a future webinar? Uh, that is a certainly yes. Uh, we will certainly be covering that. Um, I think uh, we have some pretty good content on Vizard available on our YouTube channel at the moment. But if you have specific feedback on what you want us to show, like if it's the, the hardware configurator tool, um, if it's how to make an environment or how to uh, get data out of a scene, let us know what you want to see and we can tailor it according to your guys' uh, desires there. So um, really appreciate all the feedback that we get on these webinars. Um, what model of 360 camera did Felix show? Um, that was the Instapro 360. I believe it was the first generation Instapro 360, but I could be wrong there. Um, that would be yep. what we would consider a prosumer uh, 360 camera, right? So um, one of these like little, uh, I, I have my own Ricoh Theta and you know, there's even these hundred dollar like gear, gear uh, 360. Um, but the Instapro, definitely a more, a bulky piece of equipment, but it, the results are, you know, definitely exponentially better because of uh, the additional investment in the technology. Um, I believe it's 8K, is that correct? Um, and also capable of doing stereoscopic video as well as monoscopic. Um, so this is an interesting question here uh, about uh, integrating art with spoken word. Um, the the really cool thing I think to to talk about this is if we're and we covered this in our training webinar, um, so I checked that out. But what's really cool about 360 videos is that you are ca can capture a real world environment or performance, which then a person could come back and view at a later date. Right? You can even just get a 360 camera film it and put it on YouTube and a person with a lightweight phone-based camera or phone-based headset system can actually watch that from home. Um, the, uh, the limiting factor with 360 uh, video production is gonna be, if you've ever done just regular video production at a, at a even semi-professional scale, you know, it's not as easy as just pulling your phone out and, and, and pointing it in the direction that you wanna do things. Um, 360 has its own world of, of Sort of complexities, right? So one of the key things is that you actually want to have action taking place in front of the user. You don't want to just like have things happening behind them that they might not be cued in to go around and look at, right? Um, the other thing is that lighting can be a challenge because you know there's nowhere to hide your lighting equipment when you're doing a 360 video. The, it's literally a 360 degree viewpoint. So um, you kind of have to clear the set, so to speak. Um, and have all of your other uh, production uh, tools hidden out of the way. Um, you know, uh, even if you're using a handheld version, uh, which which I do at home, um, you'll get your own hand in the it, as the sort of like bottom of the image. If you look straight down, you're kind of looking at this sort of uh, closed fist that's around uh, the camera. So you know, that's that's just one of the things to to keep in mind for 360. Um, we can go into more detail in, in, in 360, uh, absolutely. It's a really fascinating topic, and I think there's some pretty cool uh, resources out there in terms of just rules of production for 360 video, because it is, like I said, different from, from what you would be encountering with a traditional 2D video. Let's see. Um, so this last one, let me see. Do you need 3D60 video if you want to play it as a backdrop? So that's a great question, actually. Um, so the 360 video or a 360 image, uh, this can be used as a backdrop for a VR environment. So um, there's something called a skybox. Um, if I've got a 3D modeled world, especially one that's outside, um, modeling the sky or, or creating the lighting environment, uh, it might actually be cooler to have a image as your background. So what we do a lot is when we have an interior of a space, um, I don't have a, a ready example of this on my desktop, but uh, I could send this to you directly. What we'll do is we'll actually have a 360 video, uh, 360 um, picture uh, taken from, say, uh, an outside perspective, um, and then we will have that when a person looks out a window for an interior view of a of a uh, environment. When they look out the window, they're actually seeing a flat 360 picture, but it's at a certain distance in the environment 
that it looks as if it's 3D. So the, the overall effect is if I'm inside of a virtual reality environment house and I look out the window, I see a photorealistic yard, but that yard isn't modeled. It's actually just a picture of a yard that is, was captured with the 360 or 180 degree camera that we've then just put outside of that window. Um, and that's giving you, uh, you know, these are just some of the little like tricks and tricks of the trade that we picked up over the last uh, 20 years or so, but um, really effective way of, of giving a, an added aspect of realism to your environment without having to really do a lot in terms of cost of development. So um, I'm not sure if we've gotten any more questions at this point. So let me just you know, scroll through here real quick and just make sure I'm covering all our topics. Um, if there's anything that we haven't had a chance to talk to today, uh, please let us know and we will uh, get back to you directly or uh, take it into account when planning our future um, uh, presentations. But I think um, I think that's almost everything. Uh, thank you all for, for your time today um, and uh, really glad that you guys could join us. Um, let us know what you thought about this. Uh, 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 let us know what you thought about the presentation and, and the survey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time in, a, in our next World's webinar. Thank, thank you, everyone, and uh, hope you have a great day.